Welcome and good morning. Uh, we are so glad that y'all could be here with us. Uh, if you're a guest here with us, would you go ahead and look in your bulletin uh, and tear out this guest information card and fill it out and put it in the offering plate when it goes by? We would love to get that information from you. Uh, will you please stand as we read God's word together? We'll continue reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, Thus says the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close, because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray. God, I thank you for uh, your word, and I thank you that we get to come into this place uh, and worship you freely, and I ask that we never cease uh, to prepare for you and your coming. In your name that we pray, amen. Amen. If you remain standing as we sing together, as it is in heaven. Let's sing together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come and let your glory, come and let your glory fall. Our Father, who art in heaven, and rocks cry out your name. Come and let your glory, come and let your glory fall. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song to the Lord. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every heart will pray, mercy on your name. On earth as it is in heaven God give us new every morning Mercy as daily bread In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus we pray And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us with your hand. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus we pray. Father, we pray. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. To the Lord, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every of the pain, mercy of your name, on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every hope of pain, mercy of your name, on earth as it is in heaven. At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. At your name, the morning breaks in glory. At your name. Creation sings your story. At your name, angels will bow. The earth will rejoice. Your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name.
Goodness gracious, Heavenly Father. We're so thankful. We're so thankful for the Lamb of God that in my place your blood poured out. My sin was erased. It was my death. You died. I am raised to life. Hallelujah. The Lamb of God. We come before you this day, Lord God, just praising you for the ultimate sacrifice that you made for my sin and everyone in this room and in this world. We praise you for that, Lord God. And as we come to this special time in our service when we give back to you, I pray we would do that from from hearts that have been purified during the week as we've spent time with you and if, as we have sat with you a while. And Father, may we give back to you a portion of the tremendous blessings that you've poured out upon us, Lord God. Father, I ask you to be with my pastor now as in just a moment he stands he stands before us and he proclaims truth. May you protect him, Lord God. May you encourage him. May you anoint him. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray this morning. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, if you have your Bible open to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, went to the city this week, Houston, the only other place in this world that I would despise going is Austin, not because of the school, but because of the traffic. You know, it never fails, whatever city you go to, that's not Gonzales, there's always construction. I despise construction. Some of the worst times of my life, riding in the car with my father, going to see family up north in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, in the cursed section of Interstate 35 that runs from San Marcos through Georgetown, with right in the heart of that, the construction zone known as Austin, Texas. Always under construction. San Antonio is the same way. Interstate uh, Loop 410, always under construction. Never fails. Coming back from Houston this week, it had to be a godly man that I would go see in the hospital to make me go to that wonderful city. <clears throat> and uh, it was. But getting caught in construction in five o'clock traffic. You know, wouldn't you like to see a sign someday that said, construction ended, thank you for your patience? Not likely to happen, but if you would like at your funeral, whenever that may be, the Lord's timing, of course, I would, I would gladly post a highway sign at your, at your casket that said, construction ended, thank you for your patience. Because we're all under construction, okay? We're all there. We just need a little more patience. And that's what Paul is looking at for us this morning as we keep going on the disputable issues. I'm ready to quit saying that word every Sunday morning. But we're going to finish this section up of the disputable issues. It's an appropriate sign. It's an appropriate thought for us to remember that each one of us is on a different level of spiritual growth. And not one more important than the other, but we're all there. Those who are a little bit further, don't look down on those who are a little further behind. Those who are behind, don't judge those who are a little bit further down the line. And in our text this morning, Paul is going to focus all of that patience on one person, which is Jesus Christ, who is our only true hope in this life. So in our text this morning, we come across what I call just the the glory of the gospel, the gospel glory. It's a simple truth that Jesus is our one true hope. There is no other. And we live in harmony and unity as the church, and we proclaim to the world that Jesus is Lord. 
when we are in harmony, when we are in unity, we proclaim, we tell the world that Jesus is Lord. It's a message the world needs to hear today and every day until He comes back. So if you have your Bible open to Romans chapter 15, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 and I'll finish at verse 6 and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into our text. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and that through encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to stop right there for just a moment. Paul gives us an example. The way he lays this out, it's very easy to follow. He gives us an exhortation. He gives us the reasons why, and then he prays for you. And so the first exhortation this morning is live, but not for yourself. Right? Jesus came to give us this abundant life. And so we want to say live, but, but not for yourself. That's the first check this morning. Paul gives us two reminders, two commands, two exhortations here that we need to be uh, aware of, starting in verse 1. The first one is this. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. So the first one there is bear with those who are weak. To bear with someone means to do something hard and costly for the sake of another. That takes patience, that takes enduring, endurance, and it takes encouragement because we have to wait sometimes. God is bearing with us all the time. He's still bearing with His creation. He bears with us, not, long, uh, not wanting anyone to perish, but that all might come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so as God is patient with us, so we are to bear with one another, do something hard for the and costly for the sake of someone else, and that being someone who is weaker in their faith than than you are. The second thing Paul says is verse 2, let let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Please your neighbor, build him up. Edification in the church, that's what it's all about, but it's neighbor goes a little bit beyond just the church. Paul kind of goes from dealing within the church now to, to looking outside the church and pleasing your neighbor. It's a call here to humble yourself. It's a call to humility in life so that you can build up those who are weak in the faith versus using your strength to build yourself up and to be comfortable in your own strength. And we do that. We humble ourselves to build up our neighbor because this is what Christ has done for us. Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 17... Jesus has just healed a whole bunch of people. People are being brought to him. He's casting out demons. He's casting out spirits. He's doing all of these things, healing the sick. And then verse 17, Matthew writes, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. He made that personal. Right Now, here... Jesus is healing people from physical illness, okay? He's also healing people from spiritual illness. What Isaiah is looking at is not just the physical. Jesus' main point was to come and heal the the spiritual, the heart, the, the, the heart that is deceitful above all things, what Jeremiah says. And so Jesus is coming. He took our illness. He bore our diseases, our diseases of sin that lead us to a place of death and a place of separation for eternity from God unless something or someone intervene and that someone is Christ Jesus and so we are to please our neighbor we're to humble ourselves this is because of what Christ has done for us Paul's going to get to that in verse three in just a moment it means that you lay down some of your freedom in Christ right so if you are willy-nilly about eating meat sacrificed idols which probably most of us don't really care about that right now so if that's the case don't look down on your brother who has a problem with that is what Paul's saying Again, it's that same thought. Because Christ didn't do that. Because Jesus didn't look down on them. Jesus didn't judge them. He welcomed them in, which again is going to be later on in our text. Lay down some of that freedom for the sake of the weaker brother or sister in Christ. Lay it it down. 
This is what Christ has done. He laid, down, he laid Himself down at the altar of the cross for us. There's two things here. Again, neighbor. Who's your neighbor, right? It ought to kick your mind back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus teaches us there that there are two people groups that are incompatible. Forward-looking, those two people groups that are incompatible are going to come together in Him. Jews and Gentiles. Our neighbor is the world. It's also worth noting here that we need to not please ourselves. That, that pleasing ourselves, when we go after the pleasing of ourselves, that's what fractures communities. That's what fractures the church. When we go after pleasing ourselves rather than laying ourselves down at the altar for each other. Living to please yourself, it breaks down peace and harmony. It's, it's the venom that attacks and causes illness in the church. Paul continues on in Romans 15. He gives us reasons why. He gives us the exhortation. Bear with one another. Live to please your neighbor rather than yourself. Build him up. Here's why. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Those who hate God hated Jesus. And he, he willingly accepted that. Christ did not live to please himself. He didn't live for Jesus. He lived for God the Father. The insults of those who insulted you, God, those things have fallen on me. And Jesus was okay with that because he knew. He knew the plan and he knew that's what needed to happen. Jesus is both our example here and our motivation to do the same thing. Even Jesus, deserving of the world's praise and worship, did not live to please himself. In fact, he laid himself down in the, in the temptation because he was tempted with this. He was tempted with this in the, in the temptation by Satan in the, in the desert. He was tempted with all of the world's glory and all of the world's power and all of the world's worship. He knew it's coming. But that was not the right time. Jesus even himself would say in Mark 10, 45, he did not come to be served. He did not come to live for himself, to build up for himself an earthly kingdom. Yet, that'll happen. But he did not come to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life as a ransom for our sin, a payment for your sin, a payment for my sin. The life of a servant, the life of one that Paul is calling here to, to, uh, to, to lay down our lives, to be that living sacrifice, that life is not a glamorous life. That life is one of the towel and the basin where you get down and you clean people's dirty feet, where we get down and we clean people's ugliness and dirt. That is not a glamorous job. And Paul is quoting from Psalm 69 here where he says, the reproaches of those who reproached you have fallen on me. He describes a good and righteous man enduring hardship, undeserved suffering, and persecution. That is exactly what Jesus did for us by going to the cross. Jesus was willing to be mocked. Jesus was willing to be tortured. Jesus gave and laid himself down in the garden of the Gethsemane when he prayed, Father, if this cup could, be pa could pass from me, so be it, but not my will, but your will be done. There in that moment, he laid himself down. He laid his wants down, knew, knowing full well that he was going to the cross. He willingly laid himself down, was obedient to mocking, to torturing, to be killed by those who are God's enemies. And he did that to serve those around him. Those who are torturing him, those who were beating him, those who were mocking him, those who were spitting on him, he did it serving them the whole time and they knew nothing of what he was doing. And yet he was still suffer suffering and serving for them. You and I are to have that same attitude. That's a sobering thought this morning. That's a sobering thought that we are to have that same attitude that Christ had as Paul writes in Philippians 2. That he laid his life down. And no matter what he faced, he continued to lay it down. That's the first reason that Paul gives. To live, but not for yourself. The second reason Paul points us to is the Scriptures, verse 4. Verse 3 points to Christ, verse 4 points to Scripture. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. The Scriptures. As soon as Paul quotes from Scripture, Psalm 69 he says this nice little nugget of truth. What's written back then, it's not just for back then. It's not just a history lesson. It's written for your instruction today. Now, with Paul, he had the Old Testament. That was, that's where they pulled it from. And so we can go back to the Old Testament and still pull out the same gospel truth that Paul teaches. 
because all Scripture points to Christ. That we have hope through endurance and encouragement from the Scriptures. Now endurance. Endurance is pressing on in the face of hardship. If anybody could write about endurance, it's Paul. In fact, he tells Timothy multiple times. He writes in Philippians, I haven't obtained it yet, but I press on. That's endurance. In the face of hardship, he continues to persevere. Paul knows. Paul was in prison. Paul was beaten. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was starving. I mean, he was, whether in need or in want, all he had was contained in Christ, and that's all he needed. That's all he wanted. The Scriptures today tell us, still tell us three things. That the Scripture is still entirely applicable to our life. It's not irrelevant. In a day of post, post-modern Christianity, post-Christianity in our own nation, and of all of those things, the Scripture is still applicable today. We as the church must apply it to our life and do what it says. We have to obey. That is, that is the evidence of, of salvation is that we are obedient to the Scriptures. The past was written to teach us, Paul writes. It wasn't written just for our own good. It was written to teach us. Parents, that starts at home as you teach your children. So says Deuteronomy chapter 6. You remind them, you teach it. When you sit down to eat, you teach it. When you sit down to rest, it's on their mind. Everything you do is intentional about teaching Scripture. It's applicable to today. The second thing is that the Scriptures are going to center you on Christ. He came in verse 3, Paul writes, now we look again at verse 4, the Scripture centers us on Christ. All of our Scriptures point us to that central figure, Jesus Christ. Everything points to Him. Jesus told the disciples on the road to Emmaus as He began to explain from Moses all the way through that all of these Scriptures were about Him being the Messiah. And thirdly, if used correctly, the Scriptures will increase our hope. Notice again. It was written back then in the former days for our instruction that through endurance and through encouragement of the Scriptures, we might what? Have hope. You gain hope from reading the Scripture. You want to know what happens? Read the Scripture. You want to know how to correct that sin, how to get out of sin, how to, how to stop the cycle of sin? Read the Scriptures. You want to know where salvation is? Read the Scriptures, and it'll show you. The Scriptures provide us endurance. It was hard work, discipline. Remember, God didn't give us a spirit of of fear, a spirit of timidity, but He gave us a spirit of love, power, and self-discipline. Hard work in the Scriptures. And He gave us encouragement found in those sweet promises of the return of our Messiah. He's going to come. And that brings us hope. And hope and encouragement increase in our life. It fills our cup with joyful persistence and endurance to keep pressing forward. So we have Christ. We have the Scriptures. Verses 5 and 6. Here's Paul's prayer for for the church. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's praying for our unity. You know who else prayed for our unity? Jesus in John 17. The true Lord's Prayer in John 17. He prays for our unity. And when we live for Christ, and not ourselves, we will see that the world will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen to his, listen to his prayer again. May, the God, may God, who is the God of encouragement and endurance, endurance, encouragement. Let me take you on a little Old Testament journey here. Uh, some of the endurance of God, what he had and how he endures. The first stop is Psalm 52, verse 1. Listen to what the psalmist writes, David. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. No matter how evil you get, God's going to endure. The steadfast love of God will endure all the day. Psalm 136. I'm going to go faster than uh, perhaps you can turn, but listen. A psalm of praise for God's endurance. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures all forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for His steadfast love endures forever. You get the point. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 14. Oh, we're really getting Old Testament now. Ecclesiastes 3 14. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Mark that one down in your Bible. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken away from it. 
God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is, already has been. That which is to be, already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. God is a God of endurance. Lamentations chapter 5, verse 19. Right at the end of Jeremiah's lamenting. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Guess what's going to happen after the next election? Our Lord is still going to reign. He's still going to be enduring through all generations. He will endure. Listen to His prayer. Listen to His prayer. The God whose word we are reading this morning for encouragement, for endurance, He will give you, grace you, grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. That granting, that's a grace gift. It's not something we deserve, but it's something Paul is praying for. I pray that God will grant you to live in this harmony. We need that grace when it comes to relationships and dealing with each other. We need that grace for patience. That God will grant you, that's a plural word there, you as church all-encompassing. That God will grant you peace, harmony, unity. In accordance with who? In accordance with Christ Jesus. In accordance with being in Christ. It is His thinking that leads us to selflessness in Philippians 2. So if you consider yourself a Christian this morning, you are in Christ. So this, here's what this means. It means that those of you who are in Christ ought to think like Christ. And therefore live like Christ. And so a church committed to Christ will not live for themselves because Christ did not live to please Himself, but live to please God the Father and to satisfy the demands of righteousness. The result of a church living in harmony, the result of a church living in unity, the result of a church living together in Christ, notice, is one voice. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's so much deeper than corporate singing and style and all that nonsense. It's so much deeper than that. It's so much deeper than singing and being in tune with each other. The deep part on this is found in that there is a group of people, humanly incompatible, Jews, Gentiles, joining together in the singing of God's praise as one. And when that happens, the invisible becomes visible to the world. There is so much strength in the unity of the church. There is so much witness to the world in the unity of the church. The invisible becomes visible. That one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world will know that you belong to Him because you have love one for another. Look at verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol Him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Live, but live for Jesus. Live, but live for Jesus. Follows the same pattern, exhortation, reasons, prayer. The exhortation we find in verse 7, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. On what basis, what grounds are we to welcome one another? Because Christ has accepted you. He's speaking to the Christian here. In faith, by faith, you have come to salvation in Christ. And because of 
Not because of your faith, but because of the goodness and grace of God. He has welcomed you in. Unity, church unity, uh, is based on justification. We need to see that. Justification in Christ. What is justification? It is where God legally declares that you are clean. That you are righteous. Not because of what you are. Not because of who you are. Not because of what you've done. But because of what Christ has done. And in Christ you are declared righteous. That is the act of justification. And it happens the moment that you come to faith in Christ. There's no delay. There's no, well, you know, we need, to, we need to wait and see if this is real or not. If it's real, it happens in the moment that you pray by faith to receive Christ and accept His free gift of salvation and the forgiveness of sins. It happens the moment that in all of that you're also repenting of your sin and turning away from it. It happens in an instant. Justification in Christ. It only happens because you have been welcomed in Christ. If you have not been welcomed in Christ, then unity is going to be hard. It could be the very, the very reason that we see so much dissension in churches today. It's because some who are in the church are not of the church. They're not in the church. They're not in Christ. They've been in the building. Maybe some of them all their life they've been in the building. But they're not in Christ. There's a big difference. Big difference. Again, Below the surface here, the glory of God. Another reference to praising Him and, and seeing His glory in all the earth. Below the surface here, it's not, a, it's not about getting together and singing or even what we're eating together or drinking together or how we're celebrating, come and find it or take it. It's take it, isn't it? Yeah, that's what it is. Um, it's, it's that incompatible people are getting together and welcome, not, welcome one another sincerely with love. And that when they do that, they prove that God's King is bringing, God's King is bringing the world under His rule. And that welcome brings praises to God. It only happens, though, when you stand justified in Christ. You must be in Christ. The why. Verses 8 and 9. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. In order to understand justification, you understand that you must be justified because you stand condemned in your sin, Gentile. You stand condemned in your sin, but Christ Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin He paid the price for your sin, for there was a price on your life so that you can stand justified in His righteousness, stand before God as not guilty, innocent, completely free of all charges against you. That is why, verse 9, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, mercy is that God is not going to give you what you deserve. And because of God's mercy, we stand and praise God as Gentiles because of His mercy. Because Christ became a servant. You've got to see, it's all pointing back to Jesus. It all points back to Him. Verse 8, because Christ became a servant. Not because Paul became a servant. Not because Peter. Not because of him or her or whoever. But because of Christ, Jesus became a servant to His own people. And then, the second part of His mission is to bring in the Gentiles. That the Gentiles may glorify God for His mercy. Mercy is also undeserved, just like grace. Jesus was the one who would come and fulfill the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Extended on through his people to Moses and Joshua and those who would follow. Extended on to David. David's not a patriarch. Those are those three guys, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But that promise is extended all throughout the Old Testament. Jesus is the one who brings fulfillment and blessing to Abraham's descendants. He is the one in whom Jews will find access into heaven in the fulfillment of those Old Testament promises. Jesus is the one who becomes a servant so the Gentiles may glorify God for His mercy. Jesus came and now through His blood and sacrifice, both Jew and Gentile, incompatible people, two people groups opposed to each other for centuries, joined together now in Christ. And it was God's purpose all along for all nations to come to celebrate and glorify Jesus. Look at the text that Paul writes, the scriptures that he quotes the first one is from psalm 1849 therefore i will praise you among the gentiles and sing to your name 
In Psalm 18, God's king rejoices that he is going to be vindicated and will end up ruling the world. That's the context of Psalm 18. He's going to rule the world. The next one is Deuteronomy 32, 43, which is verse 10. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And Deuteronomy 32, 43, that comes right at the end of the Song of Moses. A great song that has a lot of context all around God moving his people out of Egypt into freedom. That the whole world will rejoice with God's people. All the world, two incompatible people coming together, praising God. The next one is Psalm 117. That's verse 11. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to Him, all you peoples. Psalm 117, the context of that chapter is the whole world praising God, the God of Israel, celebrating His covenant love and faithfulness, that God is a God of patience and endurance and faithfulness. The last one we find there in verse 12 is Isaiah 11.10, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. King David's greater son, not Solomon, but King's, King David's greater son, Jesus. His heir and his origin, that's the root of Jesse, passed down, will one day rule the world. As it said in Psalm 118, one day all people over all the world will hope in him. That is, they will submit to his authority. That's what Paul writes in Philippians 2. Where every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, Jesus is Lord. That is a submission to the leadership and the authority of Jesus Christ. All of those quotations make the point that the only hope, friends, for a broken world is to be reunited under the God's Messiah, the King in David's line, who will one day rule the world and that day is coming. Come Lord Jesus, we say. Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Now look at Paul's prayer, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The God of hope. Remember, hope is always future-looking. It's not looking in the past, but it's always future-looking. What will come? The God who has the power to pour out hope into your life in the darkest of times. The God who has the ability to walk you through the valley of the shadow of death and make you and cause you to fear no evil. That God is a God of hope. And He will fill you, church. It's plural again. It's not just to you, little Christian. It's to the entire body of Christ. It's plural. Will fill you, church, with all joy and peace in believing. But notice there's a qualifier here. He's going to fill you with all joy and peace in what? In believing. The key to all of this is trusting. You have to trust Him. You're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Those times will come. You must trust Him. You're going to be unified together. You're going to live in submission and lay your life down for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You then have to trust God because when you lay yourself down, you're laying yourself out there to get your rear end kicked because there's people out here that are going to kick it because they're not in Christ. You've got to be willing to find that suffering. You've got to be willing to persevere through the struggles. But endurance, encouragement, joy, peace, and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Just as grace overflows to the many, so through the unity of the church and the witness of the church bring the hope of God's rescue of Christ to a needy world that we would abound, overflow with hope. We need that hope in our life. It all happens in the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit, the one whose presence assures us of a future, the one whose presence assures us of a future resurrection, that's what Paul's referencing there again in Philippians 2, excuse me, 3, wanting to know the power of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit whose presence assures us that we are children of God, the one who prays with groans too deep for us to understand, but the one who groans with prayers from God Himself to God Himself for that promised future. Listen. This is the only way we make it. This is the only way we get hope. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing and trusting Him through this 
so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And when you walk out these doors today and you see a world out there that's, that's trapped in sin and can't seem to get out and you see crazy people shooting everybody and you see people who want to blow up our nation and, and, and some who want to blow them up. I mean, all the craziness in this life of all the stuff happening. Church, we've got to be a place of hope. We got to be a place of hope, and we got to be a people of hope, and it's going to be the Holy Spirit that fills us. Friend, you are not an afterthought of God's. He had a plan all along. You're in His plans. You're here this morning. It's not a mistake, but listen, you've got to be found in Christ. It all hinges on Him. And I would ask you are you committed to Him today? Are you really committed to Him to lay down your life as He laid down His life, to take on His mindset of humility as He did in His own life? Are you willing to take that on, to be? To be committed to Christ means that you are. If you're going to be trusting in Christ, it means that you're willing to lay yourself down as He laid Himself down so that we as a church can be unified and in harmony and that the world would know that Jesus is the Messiah. You've got to be committed to Him today. Is He the Lord of your life? Have you come to a place of complete and total surrender? Complete repentance from your sin? That's where it all begins. And church, as we are in Christ... By imitating Christ Jesus our Lord and taking on His attributes. I mean, we can't take them on ourselves, but we have to imitate those things as the Holy Spirit is in us. We're not going to become Christ, but we're going to become like Him. The church was going to do three things. The church is going to bear with each other because we've all got our strengths and weaknesses. And we're going to be grateful when we see that. Thank you for your patience. Construction ended. But we're under construction, and so we're going to bear with one another. And by imitating Christ Jesus our Lord, we're going to glorify God because we're going to be united and in harmony. And then the third thing is that we're going to accept one another because in Christ we are accepted. If you can do those things, if you can, if you can do that, and then we will continue to be a healthy and unified church family going into the future, a future filled with hope. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your time this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. Such a good word powerful word for us today, a word that centers our hearts and our minds upon Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, a word that focuses our attention on unity and how to find it, that it exists in Christ and in Christ alone, a word that says if we will focus our hearts, lay our lives down as Christ laid His down, as we turn to the Scriptures, we find endurance and encouragement to persevere, to continue on. And we find those things in Christ. Lord, what a promise we have. And if your people with ears to hear will hear this and apply it to our life, Lord, what could we see but an outpouring of your power that the world would know you are God. If you were here this morning and you need to receive Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord, now is our time of invitation and response. I want to invite you to come down and I will personally share with you how to receive Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. If you're ready to join the First Baptist Church family, now is the time to do that as well. I'm here to receive you and we can take care of that this morning. Perhaps God is just laying it on your hearts. He's got his chisel out and his hammer. You're his workmanship in Christ Jesus. And he's ready to chisel something off, but you're holding back. You don't want to let go. Whatever that could be or is, you let, that, let the Lord deal with that this morning. Maybe you need to come to the altar and pray. You come do that. As you stand for a time of response. As God is leading you, you move. Now is the time to move. Now is the time to act. Father, we thank you for a good morning. Lord, I know you're working in our hearts.
word doesn't go out and return void. Thank you for working in us. Thank you for working on us. Thank you for not giving up. I want to thank you for tuning in today um, to First Baptist Gonzales and, and worshiping with us um, this morning. I want you to remember that you're loved first and foremost by Jesus Christ. He gave his life for you on the cross. And it is a life-changing choice to believe in Him, to call on His name. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved in Romans 10, 13. So I want to urge you to call on Him today. If you have already made Jesus your Savior and Lord, maybe this morning as a result of this service, would you do us a favor and call here at the church? 672-9595. Let us know of your choice, and we want to celebrate with you. We'd also like to pray for you. You could call the church office again or... Send us an email or write us a letter and let us know how our prayer ministry can lift you and your family up to our Heavenly Father who cares about you and your family. Thanks again for watching. Pray that you enjoy our service, that you're able to worship along with us, and we'll see you here next time on TV 17. God bless.